Let me ask you a question. How do we eliminate carbon dioxide emissions? During my first week at MIT, one of my professors stood in front of the class and told us that we'd had the semester to find an answer to that question. That was over six years ago, and I'm still searching for a solution. I've come to realize that this is the question I'm going to spend my career trying to answer. Why this question? I've been asked that many times. Why climate and energy? Because failing to find a solution isn't an option. We don't have a backup planet. But by emitting carbon dioxide, we are drastically altering the face of our planet at speeds unprecedented in all of Earth's history. Earth's climate strikes a fine balance to support society as we know it. It's not too hot, not too cold. Not too wet, not too dry. Most of the time, we don't notice climate. Until that balance is disrupted. Until places that are normally wet suddenly aren't. Then we notice. We notice the drought that destroys agriculture, that disrupts food supplies, that puts livelihoods at risk. We notice the sea level as it rises to claim homes and countries. This is the Maldives, and they are noticing. We are messing with that climate balance. And once that balance is gone, it is not something that we can just get back. We cannot fail at this. I'm here to challenge you to make the choice to act and to make the commitment to solve this problem. I'm asking for grit and dedication at an unprecedented level, because this is a long-term problem. It's not just going to go away. So how do we eliminate emissions? How do we start acting? We start by seeing what we're up against and creating a vision of where we're trying to go, taking the time to understand the problem, to see the frustrations, to grapple with the challenges, to envision the possibilities, is transformative. It leaves you with a sense of depressed empowerment. <laughs> Struck by the size of the task, yet at the same time left with no choice but to do something about it. For the past two years, I've witnessed undergraduates make this transformation in a course that I help teach about climate and energy. Today, I want to begin that transformation for you. In our class, we challenge the students to design a low-carbon energy system for the United States. They start with our current system. We've built it up over the last century and a half, and as you can see by all of the red in the graph, it is largely dominated by fossil fuels. The students have to look at each component of energy use and find a way to make those green, carbon-free energy sources grow to replace the fossil fuels. When they first get the assignment, most students think it's going to be simple. There's this notion that if we just ramp up renewable energies and we all drive electric vehicles, the problem is solved. There was one student in particular, Jack, who came in with that mindset. I remember early on, Jack was asking me how required the required readings really were. <laughs> but over the course of the semester, I got to watch Jack's thinking completely change. I challenged Jack to confront just how diverse and pervasive energy use really is. Take these jeans I'm wearing, for instance. It took energy to grow and harvest the cotton, and then weave that cotton into cloth. Then cutting and stitching the fabric to make the jeans took energy. And all of that probably happened on the opposite side of the world. Those jeans had to be shipped by boat, plane, truck, before I even bought them. But the energy use doesn't end there. Every time I wash these jeans, that's more energy. Jack had to find a way to make that whole chain carbon-free. We talked about the different ways he could make that happen and what the challenges would be. If he used electric trains, he'd need to build an electric rail system from scratch. If he powered trucks with biofuels, he'd have to convert a lot of agricultural land into growing crops for fuel instead of food. It was at this point where the size of the problem really started to sink in for Jack. This is hard. There is a lot more going on than just renewables. Getting to a carbon-free world requires a substantial amount of infrastructure changes. And large infrastructure changes take time. There's no getting around it. 
but it was also at this point where Jack's attitude transformed. He started dropping by my office to talk about what a carbon-free world would look like. We discussed the challenge of renewable intermittency, the fact that the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. We talked about the impact that heating our homes with highly efficient heat pumps or using LED lights would have. Jack asked about how much energy we could get if we used food waste as a fuel. So we worked to figure it out. Imagining a carbon-free world captivated Jack. By the end of the semester, he'd made up his mind to major in environmental engineering so that he could help make his vision a reality. Now, Jack's vision of a carbon-free world relied on improving efficiency and electrifying as much as possible. And that electricity mostly came from natural gas plants that used carbon capture and sequestration technology to remove emissions and store them underground before they enter the atmosphere. But there's no one clear carbon-free world. Jack's world doesn't look like any of the other students' worlds. Each of their visions are distinct. Their ideas of future realities depend on how they think will overcome the remaining technological, social, and political hurdles. Some students think that we'll find a way to deal with renewable intermittency, and they design worlds powered by wind and solar. Other students go full force nuclear. They rely on human ingenuity, finding a way to make the technology safe and deal with waste. In our class, we focus only on the United States. Simply because if we look at the whole world, the problem becomes even larger. It's not just a matter of transitioning to green energy sources and replacing our current system. Emerging economies are looking to follow in China's footsteps and grow. As we're making that transition, we also need to be drastically increasing production, because consumption is going to keep climbing. And we need to make this conversion quickly. We build up our current system over the course of a century and a half, but we do not have that long this time around. We need to transform our entire energy infrastructure in half that time. This is a massive challenge. Right now, there is no clear path to a carbon-free world, no clear way to make that graph completely green. We aren't even asking the right questions to make that happen. Right now, we're asking, how do we incrementally reduce emissions? We want to believe that the path to a carbon-free world will be nice and straight, that we can begin by cutting emissions 10% and then 30%, and just keep cutting until we reach our goal. Our actual path will be anything but straight. The decisions that bring us closer to our goal, such as expanding our electric grid or building recharging stations for electric vehicles, probably aren't going to make a dent in current emission levels. We are asking the wrong question. We need to reframe the conversation to focus on overcoming those remaining hurdles. That's not just a job for scientists or politicians. Each and every one of us has a part to play. Overcoming those remaining obstacles is going to require a mindset transformation. It's going to require collective grit. We, as a community, need to be committed when it comes to solving this problem. The expectation that we each have a role to play must be set. Envisioning a carbon-free future is not just an assignment for the students in my class, but something we each must do. Right now, I'm working to make that happen. I'm transforming our class project into an online tool where anyone can go about learn about the energy system and design their own carbon-free world. What does your future world look like? What would it take to get there? The questions Jack and I would talk about, these are the questions we need to be asking one another. We need to talk about what we individually can do and what we collectively can do. Are we making the right decisions to get to a carbon-free world? Am I using LEDs in my home? Are we building new electric rail networks? Questions that are asked have a habit of getting answered. Keep asking them. Create your own vision of a carbon-free world and share it. Challenge others to do the same. And then, work together to make those visions reality. The task at hand is not easy. I'm not going to pretend that it is. Right now, we live in a world powered by carbon. It's familiar, and we feel comfortable in it, but that comfort is shrinking. What I'm asking is that we have the grit, that we have the tenacity to make the leap to a world of carbon-free awesome. Those worlds of familiarity and awesome do not overlap, and they are not going to. 
that jump is going to be challenging. But we need to know what we're up against. We need to look the problem head on and breathe in the full size of it. And then we need to make the decision to make that leap anyway, together. We all need to make that leap. I'll admit, there are times when this problem seems daunting. Yet at the same time, there is no way I am giving up hope. I know this is a problem we can solve together, and one day, I will tell my MIT professor we have got a solution. This is our planet. This is our home, and it is worth saving. I'm committed to work on this problem for the rest of my life. What I'm asking is that you dig in, that you find your grit, that you join me to create a better future. This is not about recycling. It is not about renewable energy. It's about mankind and caring for one another. It's about love. It's about you. And it begins now. Thank you.